Thank you, Bill, and thank you all of you for joining in and uh, being ready to hear the word of God. This morning, first session, we are very privileged to have two very well-known leaders whom I would regard as the elder statesmen of the church in Singapore. Uh, first, we have Bishop Rennes, who recently retired as the Bishop of Singapore from the Anglican Diocese. And we have also Pastor Lawrence Fong, uh, senior pastor, uh, one of the founders of FCBC, as well as the chairman of uh, Love Singapore uh, Church Network. Let me thank God for all these leaders who have been shepherding the flock in Singapore. And without much ado, we do not want to take up much of the time. We want to uh, hear from them. And for our first uh, session, the uh, speaker will be Bishop Rennes. So we'll, we want to just welcome Bishop Rennes now to just give us the word of God and what is in his heart and what God is saying to our nation in this difficult pandemic time. Bishop Rennes, over to you. Thank you. It's a great joy, brothers and sisters, to be with you and to bring you the word of God so that we may all be nourished and refreshed in these challenging COVID-19 times. Uh, uh, the times require us to have much perseverance, what the Bible calls patient endurance. So not surprisingly, our text, the word of God for us today, is from the book of Hebrews. Uh, it is a passage actually suggested by my dear brother, Bill Fu. And so I'm going to read now from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. So I bring you, brothers and sisters, a message entitled, Let's Finish the Race. Uh, this passage, uh, together with the other parts of scripture, encourage us to see the Christian life as a long distance race, as a cross country run. And uh, along uh, this run, it will not surprise us that there will be tough stretches uphill climbs. Uh, I've had, well, some uh, limited experience of uh, doing long distance at McRitchie. And those of you who have had a similar experience, you know that just when you think you're, you know, um, past the hardest stretch comes another slope, a steep one. So COVID-19 has brought about this tough stretch, this uphill climb. And we are all challenged in so many ways. But in the midst of the challenges are opportunities. And I'm sure we're going to hear from our panelists in a moment's time. But essentially, uh, COVID has introduced a tough time. Uh, just like uh, the recipients of this sermonic letter uh, called Hebrews. So the writer is writing to an audience who is in the midst of hardship. Uh, they are facing hostility from the surrounding community uh, because of their faith in Jesus. So as we read the book, we realize some of them are in prison, several are mistreated, and they are experiencing even the confiscation or plundering of their property. So this is the background of the uh, uh, situation uh, to which the writer is uh, addressing. And because of the hardship, uh, we, can, uh, we are liable to be disheartened, to lose heart, to lose morale. 
to be dissipated, to lose energy, uh, to become weary, and even to drift away. So uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 10 will say, uh, don't throw away your first confidence. Uh, don't drift off. Uh, pay closer attention to this message. Uh, this is the language we find in Hebrews. And uh, don't neglect such a great salvation. Uh, this is relevant for us, friends, as we also go through hard times and find the impact on us. Uh, there is, of course, the risk of dropping out. And it's possible, likely, that several uh, to whom the writer is writing is uh, perhaps drawn to maybe go back to Jewish practices, a return to Judaism. So uh, his response as a pastor, his response is to exalt Christ. Christ is superior and he draws the focus back to Christ. So how does he get them to persevere in the life of faith? A need that you and I also have. And that brings us to this uh, particular text. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, because what he has just done in chapter 11 is to uh, give us the roll call of those before Christ in the Old Testament who ran the race of faith. Men and women whose faith in God and in the promise of his kingdom, their faith shone so uh, brightly and they endured right to the very end. By their loyalty and endurance, they have borne witness to the possibilities of a life of faith. They have lived, they lived with the light and the promise of the kingdom to come and they remained steadfast to the end. Now, for us today, the kingdom has already come in Jesus Christ. It has come, but it is not yet complete. And uh, the goodness of the kingdom is what we are experiencing, but we also recognize we are living in the midst of a fallen world, and evil can be rampant, and evil can be at, on the ascendancy at certain times. So we too will face a testing time. And the present time, COVID-19, is such a time for which we need to cultivate patient endurance. We too need to endure, like Moses, as seeing the invisible one. And so the word of the Lord to us, to you and me today, is to run with patience with endurance, the race for which we are entered. So the good life that Christ has won for us and that Christ has ushered us into is nevertheless a life of athletic engagement. Uh, that's the metaphor, my friends, for us. Um, that is how today God is addressing us. And so I want to address this question how do we finish the race? What does this passage teach us about how we can finish the race well? Well, we'll finish the race first by flinging aside every hindrance. So it says here, after he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Um, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. So Christians, uh, in a time of hardship, we do need discipline. We do need to draw near to God that we might be sanctified and consecrated. So this text alerts us to weights that hamper and to the sin which entangles. So weights, well, there are many things which perhaps are not wrong uh, per se. They may be uh, all right in their own way, but which may hinder a competitor 
in the race of faith. So they are weights that can pull us down. For example, we may be weighed down by anxiety. Um, we are concerned about something and then our energy and attention is drawn away. We might be weighed down by undue sensitivity. So for example, if uh, someone is not um, relating to you in love, not receiving your friendship, uh, that can be on your mind and can weigh you down. And then of course, um, <laughs> we can be weighed down particularly for us as Singaporeans, by the need to achieve, the need to maximize. So I'll, I'll just illustrate this. Uh, a pastor friend of mine, he had prepared uh, his sermon for the week, uh, for the Sunday. And so on Saturday, he thought uh, since the sermon is prepared, he, he'll maximize his time and clear some uh, emails. And lo and behold, waiting for him in the inbox was a very, very critical letter. And it so affected him that uh, he shared with me the uh, Sunday following. Although he was preaching, uh, his spirit was weighed down. His mind was distracted. So uh, each contestant must learn, you and I must learn for ourselves what in our case, in his or her case, is a weight or impediment. And we need to cast it aside. The word is strong. We need to strip ourselves of these weights. And then there's the sin which entangles. Now, uh, these are things which are wrong in God's sight, which grieve God and which uh, uh, dehumanizes, they are wrong. And so while weights can be removed by prayer, we hand over to God, um, we uh, entrust things to him. But sin, my friends, needs to be repented. And the sin, well, uh, it so readily ensnares us. Uh, it so easily entangles us. That's why some translations, the sin that clings so closely. And so uh, as we seek to run the race, let's run the race by flinging aside every hindrance, the weights and the sin. May I then urge us as we hear the word of the Lord this morning, let's bring every area of our lives under the gaze of Christ and under the light of scripture. No area tucked away, no small corner where we gratify our own illicit desires. The Bible says, catch the little foxes that ruin the vineyard. And here's another verse. It's from Hosea chapter 7, verse 8. Ephraim, the northern tribes. Ephraim is a cake unturned. That, uh, think about that for a moment. You know, it's so easy in our lives to be uneven in our passion and in our surrender and in our practice of the kingdom. So a cake unturned, one side of us is red hot for God and fully surrendered. But there's another side that is totally unyielded to God. You know, we insist on our own way. We, we don't allow him to conquer that particular area in our lives. Uh, it could be an area of, um, uh, of uh, craving uh, it could be an area of bitterness. So sometimes there's a difference between our public ministry and our private family life. So uh, today, as we hear the word of God, we bring everything. We flee from temptation. Uh, we ensure that nothing grows and, and we are desperate about this. Lead us not into temptation. Uh, so this passage says, accept discipline. Because in discipline, God is removing the sin and God is taking away the temptation. So as a father disciplines his children, the Lord disciplines us uh, in order that we might share his holiness. So this is God enabling us to run. And as we hear the word of God, uh, we see the truth and we respond. So that's the first, uh, flinging aside every hindrance to the race. Secondly. 
fixing our eyes on Jesus. So that's what uh, the scriptures say. We lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer or the founder and perfecter of our faith, the one who's finished it. So here we see Jesus as the example par excellence. So having all the heroes of the faith in chapter 11, it leads now to the one who is above all else, you know, his, uh, his run, his uh, example is way above the rest in the category. He's the example of enduring faith. He is the faith's pioneer and perfecter. Uh, the author or pioneer, in that sense, he is the trailblazer. He's the one who shows us what a life is, what the life looks like, a life that believes God, trusts God, believes in God's promises and the kingdom of God that is to come. He's the trailblazer. Now, if we allow that Jesus is the pioneer, we may want to ask then, how about Abraham and Moses and others who lived the life of faith? And uh, it's very possible, my friends, as we understand the perspective of the writer of Hebrews, uh, he wants us to know that he can call Jesus the pioneer of faith because uh, Jesus in his pre-incarnate, existence was there you know uh, the passage in 1 corinthians 10 he is the rock that accompanied the people of israel in the exodus across the wilderness and therefore jesus is the pioneer because he went before even the old testament saints the work of the holy trinity engaged in all of salvation and the pre-incarnate son of god Always he's the one who leads the people of God. From the earliest times, he leads us along the path of faith. What great encouragement for us. And he's also the perfecter or finisher. In other words, it's in Jesus that faith reaches its perfection. He is the one because he trusted God with his life even unto death, death on a cross. And he trusted God that he would not see uh, the land of the shadow of death. He will be raised up. He will not see decay. He is the one who models beyond all else this life of trusting God. And he has completed it. It's his sheer faith in God that carried him through the taunting, the scourging, the crucifying. Uh, this is a time in many churches, we have 40 days before Easter, a time of reflecting on the passion and suffering of Christ. So it is his faith, his loving obedience to God based on faith that saw him through the passion not only the physical and emotional suffering, but the more bitter agony of rejection, desertion, and dereliction, because he who knew no sin was made sin. So he is the finisher of our faith. And so the writer urges us in verse 3, consider him, consider Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. This word consider means compare and weigh up. As you and I go through hardship and sufferings, you see, in the passion of Jesus, Jesus models for us what it means to be, to have to go through innocent suffering. And so Christians, we are not exempt from the hardships that come with COVID. And we might find, why are we having to go through this? But look at Jesus. He's the model of innocent suffering under God that brings about a fruitfulness. So he is our supreme example. He's the one who inspires us 
Therefore, when we become weary on the way or grow faint, let us look up to him. Let us consider him looking to Jesus. My friends, this is important because in a time of hardship, emotions can swing. So the way to get through a difficult stretch is not to conjure up feelings, not to try and self-generate positivism, etc. It is really to look to Jesus in his word, to have our minds engaging the truth of God. So that's the way uh, to, to finish the race, by looking to Jesus. Now, it does invite us to look to him, not just as our example par excellence, but to look at Jesus as the exalted Lord. Because Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's at the end of verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who now is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. My dear brothers and sisters and friends, there is one appointed by God and he has come and he has conquered and he can lead us through any storm and any, through any difficult and possibly destructive stretch. He can because he is high above all powers and principalities. Uh, looking to Jesus is to remind yourself Jesus is on the throne in sovereign control of all that happens. And in the midst of the darkness, in the outbreak of suffering and in the ascendancy of evil, Jesus is in control and harnessing all things for God's kingdom and God's saving purposes. So, and he, you know, he's high priest. Hebrews wants us to know he's there also as our high priest interceding for us at the right hand of God. The powerful prayers of the son of God for our protection, our provision and our endurance. One writer reflecting on this says, we are to look at him, to look at Jesus high and exalted. And what do we find? We find his gaze upon us, his limitless power and his unswerving commitment to sustain us and to save us to the uttermost. Jesus, our all sufficiency. He is as reliable as the covenant he has now brought about that we are forever his and no nothing, no weapon against us will prevail. So you have there then that we are to finish the race by flinging aside, being decisive, ruthless in the grace of God, putting away every weight and every sin, every hindrance, but running the race by fixing our eyes on Jesus. And now thirdly, finally, we finish the race by focusing on the finishing line. In focusing on the finishing line, I bring you now, when you focus on the finishing line, my friends, the text before us says, who for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. I want you to know that when you focus on the finishing line, you're setting your mind on the joy that awaits you. That helps us to get through the difficult stretches in life. The joy of completing the course. Uh, that's what awaited Jesus at the finishing line. He, he, he would have fulfilled God's purposes and he is exalted. And his exaltation brings victory to all those who trust him. It's the victory for his people. It's a, a joy that he will share with those who follow him, who put their lives in his hands. And so in John 15, he says to his disciples, my joy will be in you as I complete what the father has given me to do. My joy. So whatever our showing and however difficult the stretch, that joy is feeding our souls now. It's a joy that Jesus shares for those for whom he died as a sacrifice and lives as high priest.
That's where he's gone. He's gone into the very presence of God and he shares the throne of God as God's victorious king. And that's where we are headed. The glorious presence of God, the new heaven and the new earth. That's the goal of the pathway of faith. And our pioneer, Jesus, has reached it first. And now we who then trust him and who endure to the end, we will share in that glory. So it's the vision of completing the race. I want to share that with you too, friends, because uh, in a testing time, we do need the Lord to renew the joy of completing what he has given us to do. I think most of us have a vision of God, what, of what God wants us to do. And Deuteronomy 34, 7 says, Moses uh, was 120 years old when he died. And then it says his eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. Deuteronomy 34, 7. Beloved, we too need to lift our eyes and keep the vision. So one a Jewish rabbi commenting on this is, his vigor was unabated because his vision, his eyes were undimmed. So may God renew the vision of the completeness. We have finished the race. We have uh, fulfilled uh, God's purpose for us. And so the vision of what God has given you and me to do. And then there's the joy of Jesus's embrace. Don't miss that. Because in this picture, surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, the witness par excellence is Jesus himself. And as we finish the race, we patiently run the race to the very end. We are embraced. We are congratulated. We are rewarded with nothing less than the embrace of Jesus. And to use the words of scripture, our Lord saying to us, well done, good and faithful servant. The joy of his embrace. So I summarize now, dear brothers and sisters, may the word of God spoken to us this morning by the Holy Spirit, may the word of God cause us to finish the race by flinging aside every hindrance, by fixing our eyes on Jesus and by focusing on the finishing line. I've got a home in glory land, the joy of the victory. And now as I finish, I've majored on let us finish the race. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is so rich. I now want to provide a bridge to what my brother Lawrence will be bringing us. The, the, we, in running this race, my friends, the writer to Hebrews says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So uh, as we come this morning and as we receive new strength, new refreshment, yeah, a strength from above to run this race before us, let us remember this race, when we run it well, brings blessing to others. How to stir up one another to love and good works. A time of hardship is a unique time for us to bear witness to Jesus, <laughs> to bear witness that in the faithfulness of God, he has given us the Savior. He's given us the shepherd who will never, whose love will never let us go. And this love is for every person and it brings life and love and truth. So may it be so that you and I strengthened by the word of God, filled with the spirit. We, let's finish the race. God bless the word to our hearts. Thank you, uh, Bishop, for that great um, encouragement and to inspire all of us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, to be focusing on the preaching line, and also to cast out all the entrances. We want to thank Bishop for this morning's message. Afterwards, you have a time for Q&A. Do submit some of your questions on the Q&A uh, on the panel there. And now we want to welcome uh, Pastor Lawrence Kong to just give us the word of Lord that God has laid upon his heart. Let's welcome uh, Pastor Lawrence Kong. God bless you. It's such a joy to be uh, able to share the word with you. Uh, Bishop Renes and I, together with Pastor Edmund Chan, has spent uh, the whole last 
last year, meeting every week to pray, to pray for Singapore, to pray for one another, and to pray that the destiny of Singapore will be preserved, but the purposes of God will be accomplished through this time. So, so I, I, he, we know each other's heart, and thank you, Bishop, for setting the foundation. The foundation uh, of everything we do is upon Jesus. That's why our eyes must be focused upon him. But I want to go beyond that and then see what is the finishing line that the Lord has placed upon us that is applicable for all of us. In the beginning of this uh, COVID uh, season, when we are restricted uh, to our home, I, uh, the Lord spoke to me through a verse that I've, I've shared with different groups, but I really feel like it is a, a vital word from the Lord. And it's taken from the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, 29 to 31. Listen as I, list, uh, as I read it for you. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as, as, as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. I find that COVID uh, is, uh, is, is a great uh, equalizer. Uh, it's a great equalizer in all ministry. Uh, small church have major problems as they are restricted in what they do. And big churches have bigger problems because they have an overhead to have to maintain and, uh, and to get things in motion again. So their challenges, I'm sure it's the same thing with businesses. Uh, a small business has its unique uh, challenges of uh, just kind of fading away. A big business now has to see what are the important things that we must focus on and what are some of the things that needs to be removed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the passage we had just read, Paul was discussing some domestic issue that we all struggle with, uh, very down-to-earth things like the role of sex in marriage, singlehood, uh, what if your unbelieving husband uh, uh, desert you and so forth. Yet in the midst of all these real issues, Paul tried to reframe the whole picture from an eternal perspective. And that's what we need to do as we come together. He reminds his reader that the time is short. Our lives are transient. The world is not our home. The reality of the eternal hope far outweighs the relentless struggles of our lives and ministry here on earth. The Lord began to burn in my heart a deep sense of urgency to recommit my life and ministry so that it will be aligned with the heart of God to fulfill God's assignment for me on earth. And each of us need to do that for ourselves. What is the finishing line that God has uh, given to us? And, and knowing that time is short does not mean that we need to rush. In fact, it means that we need to rest in the Lord. And that's where Bishop said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and then begin to understand what are the important things that really matters for us as believers called to be a light in this world. So the first thing I want to share with you, the time is short. We cannot waste time doing a lot of good things, but not the very thing that God has given to us to do. Uh, and our assignment on earth. But the second thing I want to share with you is that I've discovered that it is very easy in our life to confuse the means from the end. In other words, we confuse the process from the purpose. And we're caught up in processes. And after a while, when we're dealing with problems, we forgot the end goal. Many years ago, I was I was told an interesting story, I don't know whether it's real or not, about uh, a guy taking a group of businessmen through a very sophisticated oil refinery. It, in that refinery, there's some of the state-of-the-art machinery that can convert crude oil into all sorts of pre petroleum product in great speed and with great uh, efficiency. And in the midst of that uh, tour, one of the a uh, businessman who is really into marketing begin to ask the guy, uh, sir, can you show me where the shipping department is? And the guy says, I'm sorry, we don't have a shipping department from, uh, in this uh, refinery. This guy was shocked. He says, 
no shipping department. I mean, then how can you ship out all the products that you have generated out of this refinery? Shipishly, the guy said, you know, the fact of the matter is our machineries are so huge that it takes all the petroleum that we produce to run them. We have nothing left to ship out. Of course, this is a joke. Uh, no business will ever do things like that. In fact, no corporation will ever do that except one place I've discovered after my almost 50 years of full-time ministry. And that is the Church of Jesus Christ. I have discovered that it's in, it is possible for the church to so fill ourselves with so much activities, keep all our members occupied in one program after another, in one training after another, in one uh, kind of uh, conferences. And we are right now having a conference. I'm not belittling that, but, but we need to watch it in another so that we don't have the time to ship out the gospel whereby people can hear the gospel and fulfill the great commission. And the result of that is, we always talk about that, but the Great Commission becomes the Great Commotion. <laughs> it was Albert Einstein who said, the perfection of means and the confusion of goals seem, in my opinion, to characterize our age. I want to humbly share with you that there's only one purpose for which God has redeemed us and keep us on earth. There's only one reason why when we give our life to Jesus Christ, he doesn't take us away straight away into the presence of God. Wouldn't that be good? But, but there's only one reason. And that one reason is that we are to be on earth as the light of this world to bring salvation to the people who do not know Christ. We are to disciple the nations. We as a church live not for ourselves, but for the world that needs to see the evidence of God's presence on earth and then have an opportunity to respond. Anything else is secondary to that. It was C.S. Lewis who said, the church is the only institution that exists primarily for the benefit of those who are not its members. One of our problem is our churches exist to just feed our members to just make our members feel satisfied and happy. And we forgot that that purpose is only transitory. Actually, it is for us to be able to be a blessing in the world. You know, I, I want to share this humbly with you. The aim of our Christian life here on earth is not just to worship God. Now, we have to worship God because the worship of God brings the presence of God. Without the presence of God, there's no power and there's no reality as we share the gospel. But if worshiping God is our ultimate aim on earth, then we may as well go back to heaven because now we can worship with the angels, all right? I want to sub submit to you that our ultimate aim of our Christian life here on earth is not to just live a holy life. Of course, we need to live a holy life because then God can use us as a usable instrument to be a blessing for others. But if holiness is our ultimate aim in life, then we may as well go home. Then we'll be more like Jesus than we can ever be. In fact, our whole purpose in life is not just to be able to cover the Bible from cover to cover and know all the truth of the Bible. We need to do that because if we don't know the truth of the Bible, how can we share the truth? But if all we want to do is to know and understand the Bible, then go home because then we will know as we are known. You see, so sometimes we have confused the end with, uh, 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 confused our means with the ends. We end up doing all this and we keep ourselves busy and yet we don't realize that our calling on earth is that you and I can become a blessing to the nation. And we can do many things. We can feed the poor. We do all these things and we do that in Faith Community Baptist Church. We do that even as a Love Singapore and a movement serving, serving the poor. But, uh, but I want to say this to you, that there's only one thing that we can do that no one else on earth can do, is to share the gospel of salvation so that they might have eternal life. Everything else is needed to bring us to a place where we have the authenticity to do it. But don't confuse that with the ultimate purpose. This truth can easily be proven from scripture, all over scripture. 
the purpose and the mission of our church, the purpose of your life and my life is that as a result of that, people are coming to know Jesus Christ because we are disciples of the Lord and we make disciples, not as an occasional thing, but as a purposeful thing and as a thing that we see regularly in our life. And this is what we are committed to in my church in a COVID season. In fact, our cells are better attended now. You've got no excuse for not attending. You don't even need to come to my <clears throat> somebody's home. You just tune in the Zoom. We continue to reach out to the lost. And on an average in our church, we have more than 300 every week of new people, pre-believers, who are in our cells. And, and, and in just the year 2020, we have more than 1,000 people giving their life uh, to Jesus Christ. Why? Because in our church, we want to say that we want to know God more, we want to walk with God more, we want to worship, we want to know the scripture in order that our life will be productive. I want to share that with you because this is, this is the mission of all that we do. And we can show that from scripture. One of the first things Jesus did, we read in Mark chapter 1, <clears throat> was to call his disciples. And when he called his disciples, Simon and Andrew, what did he say to them? He said, Follow me and I will make you fisher of men. Follow me and you live the way I live. You become more like me. You will become fishers of men. That was his opening statement. That was his introduction of his ministry. That was a purpose. And then we all know <clears throat> the Great Commission. Before he left, he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given you. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's the purpose. And I'll be with you to empower you, to encourage you. And then when he resurrected, everybody were excited and everybody asked, is that when you want to restore your kingdom? And, and some of them probably think, what, where, what position will I take in the, in the new kingdom that you're going to establish? And, and, and Jesus said in Acts 1, 7 and 8, it's not for you to know the time and season which the Father has put in his own, uh, put in his own authority, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. I know we've heard all these verses, but, but I think we need to grasp this, especially in a time like COVID, where resources are few, where, where many things we can't do, but what is that one thing that we must do that must keep on doing? That was what happened to the New Testament church. They met in the homes, and the Lord added to the church daily, those who are being saved in Acts chapter 2. Now, if you have a cell group meeting in your HDB flat, do people next door to you come to know Jesus Christ? Do the people living on top and beneath you come to know Jesus Christ? Then how come in the meeting in their home, people come to know Jesus Christ? Well, Acts chapter 5 tells us that uh, Acts chapter 5, 41 to 42, but I just read the pertinent part. Daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as Christ. The whole meet meeting were evangelistic. That's all they wanted to do because God transformed them, give them the power and the purpose and the fire to share the gospel. So I just want to remind us, the time is short. Let's do the things that really count for eternity as we get right with God. And that is, that we will become fishers of men. The church will begin to win this nation for the Lord. You know, I think God is preparing Singapore for a mighty harvest. Uh, 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 you know, uh, I just want to share, I, I didn't plan to share this, but, but you know, a good friend of mine, Pastor Nico from, from Indonesia, he, he's a co-chairman of uh, Empower uh, 21. Uh, and we have many, many big meetings together. And when COVID hits, in one week, 10 of his most senior pastor in his, in his church died in one week. The most senior ones. He has almost 100,000 people in the greater Jakarta uh, area. I call him up, wanting to encourage him. And I said, Pastor Nico, are you okay? And he looked at me and he said, Pastor Lawrence, I want you to know the greatest harvest that men will ever see is coming. It is around the corner. Let's get ready for the big harvest. Here's a man that look at the final purpose. We are here to be a witness. So, so we exist as a church primarily for his members, not for, uh, for his non-members, not for us. 
how, how, how blessed we are. We are blessed, but that blessing must go on. Now, I want to come and apply very quickly in the remaining time to what I feel God is doing in Singapore. And I want to take reference from Love Singapore. And please understand, Love Singapore is not the only thing that's happening. I think the celebration of hope has shown to me that, that there's a greater level of unity beyond Love Singapore. And I see that happening. The fact that Bishop Renes, myself, Pastor Edmund Chan can meet every week just to pray for the issues of the nation has caused us to understand that we appreciate the body of Christ more. But what has actually surprised me with Love Singapore was that he has survived so many years. It is into our 27th year. And 27 years ago, it was Dr. Peter Wagner who asked me to lead the Spiritual Warfare Network to pray for the nation, but it must be done as a united body of Christ. He challenged me to rise up to unite the church so that we can see revival coming to Singapore. I felt that I was the most unlikely uh, candidate for the job to unite the church because uh, if you know anything about my history, at that time, I just was, uh, well, I was fired from the church. And the result of that, there was a church split. So, so a man who is known to have split a church to try to unite the church is a bit of irony. Uh, but I guess the Lord uses the weak things of this world to confound the wise. And so I guess for that, I fit the bill, all right? And yet, amazingly, just not knowing what to do, gathering the pastors in small group, Love Singapore has become a movement that that has incorporated many things and we saw God using us to bring healing to the nation and we begin to see blessing. And I've asked God why. And the reason was this. While Love Singapore was a prayer movement, we all come together, unite the church, but it was focused on winning the loss for Jesus Christ. It was focused on putting a cell in every block. And we had a dream that Singapore would turn Godward as we put a cell in every block, and as these cells are established, they keep on bringing down the presence of God and begin to walk this, the block and begin to love their neighbor and begin to share the reality of God. And, and we're going to see them being used uh, by God to bring about the salvation uh, of, of the nation by seeing Singapore turning Godward. That was the first season. It took us seven years. At the end, we wanted to have a big harvest. It didn't turn out the way we wanted it to be. I think Celebration of Hope did much better uh, than we did. But nevertheless, that seed of wanting to see that the destiny of Singapore is fulfilled by seeing Singapore turning God word and as a result, becoming a blessing to the nation. In the second season, uh, it was Pastor Rick Seward who took over the leadership. And I thank God for this brother. Uh, I miss him dearly, dearly, dearly. Uh, we, were such, we were such partners together. And him being focused on missions uh, started us on believing that Singapore church can go into Timor Leste and begin to transform the nation. And now after almost uh, uh, 20 years, I'm saying to you that uh, Timor Leste, uh, the churches has risen up, the pastors has taken over in terms of believing God for that nation. I mean, not the whole nation has been saved yet, but we saw what... Uh, 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 Singapore church have done by uniting our hearts together and by being a blessing to them. But I want to bring up something that was missed when Pastor Rick was in charge for seven years before I came back. He actually sound the same call again for us to actively share the gospel within Singapore and see revival taking place. And his strategy was to get churches and Christians to adopt every single block, HDB block and its neighboring uh, uh, residents, all right, to, to, to really own them and begin to pray for them that God will intervene. He had a dream that if every block is being adopted by a church or by a cell group or by a group of Christians who say, I will go and walk this block prayer walk it, pray for it, begin to serve the resident and begin to own it. And then we're going to see people coming to know the Lord one by one. And if there's a big harvest, these are the people we're going to bring to them. And, and that sense of ownership. Uh, and, and Pastor Rick made a very strong argument for that. 
The reason is that God has actually made Singapore very unique. He has set us up for that. Singapore, you know, is into a lot of social engineering in a good sense, all right? And that's why there's so much harmony among the races and the different religions. And the Singapore government has put people of different social status and different religious background living together so that in the same prison there are uh, two-room flat, three-room flat, four-room flat, and uh, executive flat, so that uh, people of different sector comes together. And if we adopt these blocks, you will find that you would, you and I would have adopted 80, more than 80% of Singapore population. Eight, more than that, we are able to locate them, serve them, love them, and pray for them. Imagine with me, one day, if every block has a cell, that begin to say, I want to see this block coming to know the Lord. And after a while, serving them, knowing almost every person by name is possible. I have churches like, uh, uh, like uh, Pastor Lawrence Chua Church, Pastor Guna Church. They almost know every person in the block. And they are on the prayer list and begin to pray for revival. You know, that was shared by Pastor Rick. But at the time, we didn't really quite pick it up. Maybe we we're all you know, going to Timor last day. But in recent time, before the celebration of hope, I was, uh, the, 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 the Love Singapore team was coming together to pray. And as we prayed, we felt, wow, you know, we need to restart this whole thing again. Call the churches together and love Singapore block by block. This time, we're going to do it from the grounds up. In the coming months, we're going to meet with pastors from different prisons, bring them together, whatever a denomination they are from, whatever background they are from, and start to love each other and pray for one another. And out of that, start to say, these are the blocks that are around my church. Now, can we adopt them? Can we kind of divide and conquer and begin to help each other to start praying for them and winning them for Jesus Christ? Now, someone have asked that maybe many people who live especially the, the younger people, especially those who have a career. They, they, their social life don't really revolve about, around their block. That's where the marketplace comes in. You see, adopting them, we will get to know who they are. You know, we, we serve a family. Maybe we don't get to see the father very often because he's always out for work. But we get to know them because we get to know the children, get to know their wife, get to minister to them and the family. And then we begin to locate where they are from and begin to say, hey, you're working in this Shenton way, you're working in this block, we have got other Christians there that you can connect with. And we begin to love Singapore block by block. Uh, my time is up. Uh, I've got another five minutes. Let me just share with you very quickly uh, one initiative that uh, we have um, started. Uh, uh, actually, not through Love Singapore primarily, but I don't know whether you might have it right here. Uh, Okay, uh, let me see. Yep, uh, we can see our objective, right? Okay. Uh, this is the one. Yeah. You know, in the year 2019, Touch International, which is part of my organization uh, uh, with Touch Community Services, we do international work because we, we, we are not able to travel so much even towards the end of 19. 2019, we began to talk to uh, the leadership of the land, uh, uh, MCCY and so forth, about developing good neighborliness. And uh, actually, we caught up with them. We, we, they, we, we, we talked to them and, um, and we say, you know, we should develop this uh, neighborliness. Uh, we, we follow something that uh, our prime minister has said, the most fundamental factor in keeping Singapore exceptional it's not good plans or adequate resources. It's whether we remain united. So we, 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 we leverage on this statement and say, you know, one of the ways to get united is to get uh, uh, people to get to know each other in the neighborhood and not just uh, uh, go about their own life. And, uh, and we believe that the simplest uh, yet most powerful expression of nation's unity is good labeling less, especially to persons and family living immediately next door to us. Therefore, this movement aims to encourage Singaporeans and its residents to, uh, to make that commitment to be a good neighbor 
breaking down physical and social barrier between neighbors. And uh, uh, we got the support of MCC Wise, uh, SG Together, Singapore Kindness Movement, uh, Good Neighborhood, uh, SG Assist, and, uh, and, and Together, uh, Stronger Singapore. And, and they begin to, uh, we begin to kind of talk to them, what can we do? So we designated National Day as a Good Neighbors Day. And, uh, and in 2020, because you know, there's no large event, uh, we want to make it a memorable one. So we made a commitment uh, with NCCY that we will get as many people to, uh, to reach out to their neighbor and, uh, uh, and, and, and to begin to share kindness uh, together. Uh, we, uh, we, we were given sponsorship. Uh, and in fact, uh, MCCY and the rest paid it fully. Uh, we have this ribbon that tie to our neighbor's uh, door and say, we want to be a good neighbor to you. And uh, many of them, actually many of our church people and many who did that, don't just do that. They actually put a little bag of cookie and say, uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, we love you. And we are so glad that you are our neighbor. And there are churches who have done that and, uh, and had very good response. So uh, we even give it to uh, uh, school children uh, to do that. And, and we did a card and said, I pledge to be a good neighbor uh, uh, to you, just to break the ice. Uh, in 2020, uh, uh, we, 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 we got a support of 80,000 from MCCY. 220,000 good neighbor kids were distributed with the Singapore Kindness Movement to, to primary four and sec two uh, students. Uh, we targeted office engagement up to almost 800,000 uh, uh, sets. And we have social media campaign and we have 590,000 impressions uh, on on uh, how this has uh, been a, a good thing. Um, and then as we reach out, we, we, we have collected 110 story of good neighborliness from the public. And many of them are initiated by church people, but many of them are also just uh, ordinary citizens who want to get involved. Uh, one interesting thing in, in the year 2000, uh, we were able to get uh, a lot of F&B partners and uh, by the way, uh, Tung Lok is one, one of them who has helped us uh, greatly. Uh, they, they even give a meal for a special discount or we give, they, they give a kind of two meals for the price of one so that you can give Thank it you. to the neighbor and then you can uh, also have one yourself. So this is picking up and the government seems to be very committed to want to promote it. I really feel uh, people sure. ask me, how can we get started? We get started by just taking small steps to love our neighbors. And, and okay. with that, I just want to say, this is a good start. If we start doing, taking these steps like that, we will be able to create an atmosphere where we are always reaching out uh, to our neighbor. Okay. Because we are called to love our, thing of our, our land block by block. Thank, thank you. you. I just want to uh, stop here and thank okay. you for allowing me to share. Uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Kong. Now we, I, I head over to Brother Georgie and also to Victor for the Q&A. Uh, over to you first, uh, Georgie and Victor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pastor Kong, for that uh, inspiring sharing and also challenging us into reaching out block by block. Uh, my question directed to uh, Bishop Ren is, during this we have spoken about it. Many are suffering. People are retrenched. Some are struggling to put food on the table and so forth. And several industries have been severely impacted. We hear your message about how we should, the, what the word of God uh, reminding us in this studying time, how we should respond. A big challenge to many believers, uh, as to all of us in, in the marketplace, especially here is, is to be able to live a coherent faith in which we can see how do we let our faith pan out in actual situations and struggles that we face in life, especially those who are trying to put food on the table, lost their job. And they will very often they say, you only know how to talk, no? I, I, I got to find food for, to, for tomorrow, right? These are very practical, real issues. Perhaps you could just suggest some practical handles. Uh, you know, we have the word of God. A lot of us have the word of God, but how do we activate it in real life situation? How do we have some practical handles as to how can we 
do something or how do we cling on to the presence of God to bring us through this struggle? So over to you, Bishop Brennis. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Georgie. So the love of God is to be made real and practical. And so we ourselves need to have that uh, confidence and that motivation about making real the love of God. So uh, let, let me link up with what Brother uh, uh, Lawrence just mentioned. Uh, we need to get alongside people to know what the needs are. So Jesus teaches us to live near the pain. Uh, near the human needs of people. And so uh, the Love Singapore initiative of uh, uh, Loving Singapore block by block is one way of mobilizing us to come alongside people so that we might know how we can respond to their needs. You know, so our Lord does say, feeding of the 5,000, go and see what you have. Marketplace also has an important uh, uh, potential, friends, because you are alongside the people with their real needs, including, of course, the workers, you know, and how they are doing. So I think that there is a mobilization of the whole body of Christ in this whole realm uh, that you have mentioned, Georgie, of practical care. Now, it is not as simple as we maybe um, idealistically think of it. It needs to be sustainable. Uh, we need to know that helping the poor and helping people in need is going to be engaging. There's a need for discernment, a need for processes also. How do we screen off uh, the freeloaders and so forth? So uh, I see the whole church being mobilized. Uh, so the centrality of Jesus Christ, he is the anchor, our living hope, and he is the hope to share with others. And the hope is not deferred hope. The, the hope is not you know, only in the kingdom to come. The hope is now God attends to our present needs. Now. So I can see local churches beginning to relate to the community organizations. So some of the things that Lawrence have, has shared is like a template, no? You, you work with other agencies. I mean, we do thank God that we live in a society where there is uh, the, 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 the willingness and, and the, the attentiveness to people in need. It, it, it certainly needs to, to grow and improve and so forth, but it is there. The baseline of government organizations, grassroots organizations are there. So the church now coming alongside so that, you know, um, uh, looking out particularly for those in the rental blocks, but also as we live. So this neighboring, huh? So if you find that your, your neighbor whom you often meet in the lift going to work is no longer there, you need to find out are things all right? Is you know is his job intact and so forth? So um, so I'm with you. Uh, it's with the local pastors and the grassroots movement together with the marketplace leaders. So how employers also in their organization can look out for people in need and provide the need, whether it's accommodation or a weekly a food voucher. Yeah, we have, and our response during COVID times gives me and Lawrence and Edmund and other senior pastors, there's hope that the people of God are there uh, to be mobilized. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Pastor Renes. Uh, my question to uh, Pastor Lawrence is, uh, you know, in this uh, challenging COVID-19 environment, uh, in a sense, what Georgie has mentioned, people are facing the reality of uh, job security, keeping the businesses alive without retrenching staff, personal health challenges on top of that. How can we continue to lift our eyes from all the personal and family challenges and continue to love our neighbor, to see beyond our present circumstances? Uh, Pastor Lawrence? I think, uh, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, surprisingly, when we begin, to reach out to people with need, 
we realize how blessed we are. We, I mean, we are not trying to ignore our own problems, but we begin to realize that there are you know, people, you know, you complain you can't walk properly until you see someone with no legs. Hmm. And, uh, and we found that as we begin to look outward, it actually does something to us that, that we develop a sense of uh, the heart of God and we begin to be content with what we have. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to share some things that we have done. Uh, you know, in a sense, I, I am a, a pastor, but I'm also a marketplace person because I, I run an entertainment business. Uh, I, I run a, 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 a professional theater. And you know, uh, the arts and entertainment uh, industry is totally shut down. Okay, mm. I mean, it's like devastated. I mean, it's not in, even in Singapore, West End and uh, if West End and uh, uh, Broadway is uh, being shut down, uh, this is terrible. But we decided that in this time, and we, we run into cash problem. We have a theater uh, that, that has a very big overhead and, and uh, there's no renter, zero renter. And, and so we said, we, we're gonna do something different. Okay, we got to give instead of ask. So we actually let our theater be shared uh, almost free of charge. All right, because we're not going to get any money anyway. Let's use it for the purpose of God. So we help budding artists to use our space and, uh, you know, and give it to them. We, in fact, activated what we used to have, a Love Singapore Fund. And then we begin to say, uh, some of you are totally our job. We want to help you. Uh, I, I, I know Pastor uh, Bishop Rene said, you know, we want to, you know, we worry about the freeloader. When we, when we help the poor, they will always be freeloader. And sometimes we, we get cheated a little bit, but that's an investment. Uh, but we want to go back to what Love Singapore was all about. It is to serve people with no string attached. They don't need to come to church. They don't need to hear my presentation of the gospel. So I found that uh, it was in helping others that we ourselves found uh, a, a sense of purpose and a sense of blessedness to realize how much God has given to, to us. And, and that's, that's uh, in my theater and uh, our church has really got involved in the community. Uh, when they need mass distribution, uh, they really don't have volunteers. We were there or go out. And then we, we sent 100 people there. And so they, they said, thank you so much. Uh, uh, these are just long-term engagement of relationship and trust mm -hmm. that I think will bring, bring great dividend for the sharing of the gospel. And, and that took us away from our own problems in spite of all the struggles we have. I don't know whether that helps, but that's just uh, uh, what we have discovered. Okay, thank you. And um, maybe I can just uh, take this question to Bishop Brennis from one of a member of our audience here. And he's asking this question to Bishop. Is persistent fears and anxiety considered as sins in the eyes of God if it is not dealt with rightly with God? Bishop, would you like to answer this uh, question? Uh, uh, Bishop, you're on mute. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you for the question. It's a very important uh, question. So our weakness is not sin. Uh, we need, therefore, to mourn our losses, to face up to our true struggles. But we need with God, we need the help of the community to turn Godward. Mm. And so what COVID has done is to actually engender the conditions in which we are learning to relate to one another directly and personally. What can I do for my neighbor? What can I do for my uh, colleague at work, et cetera? and see how we can help them out of what may be called a miry pit. So if I may answer the question more directly, uh, persistent anxiety is not a sin for which you are then uh, to strike yourself or others to judge you, but to indulge in it, uh, to, 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 to persist in, in self-pity and, and, and resignation, is also not the right response to a God who wants to help you. But people need help. 
And, and I think we need to develop this one anotherness within the community uh, so that help is not always professionalized. There's, there's need for it at the, uh, at the right level uh, of need, but many things can be helped in the one anotherness. So it's important to build one-to-one -one relationships, personal evangelism, discipleship, and care, pastoral care, plus the small groups. By God's grace, Singapore allows us to meet. So I want to encourage this so that the love and help can reach the person in need. But let's not be judgmental. Rather, let's help. Uh, two are better than one. If one falls down, there is another to help him up. And we do have bouts, my friends. So no matter how spiritually strong you are, we do have doubts when we are swamped. The waves overwhelm us. But God will be our rock and we may need help, the help of scripture, the help of one another to get back on the rock. Thank you, Pastor Renes, for that. You know, uh, Pastor Lawrence, you shared also an interesting story about how a super modern refinery that consumes all of its uh, products and you drew a parallel with the local church that only tends to serve its own uh, congregation. Mm -hmm almost like an exclusive club. Uh, here's a question that I picked up from uh, one of our participants. Uh, and his question really is, what are the possible uh, insidious derailers, things that can possibly derail us as individuals and as a church uh, and, and that we must guard against uh, from achieving and accomplishing the purposes uh, that God has for us, uh, at this, especially at a time such as this? I think one of the big challenge is a myopic view of issues only from a personal perspective. That's why just now when I share that, when we begin to see God's purpose for us, far outweighs just those pesky problems that always will remain, whether that's COVID <laughs> or non-COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. And we begin to live for the Lord and for others God began to take our heart beyond just being uh, trapped with our own struggles to be able to be a blessing to others. Someone said this word to me. He's a businessman. He's a billion, billionaire. He said, I tell my team in this time, don't let a crisis go to waste. All right. Maybe this is the time to rethink uh, how we think we do things or uh, reorientate our outlook. So I think while I raise up this issue, and it is a real issue I've seen in many churches, but I think the, uh, this is so important. And as we look outward, uh, it, it actually helps us uh, to see a bigger picture. And then the second thing we, we want to say is this. We, we, uh, we got to live in community. Sometimes uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have in our Western mindset and in the so-called post-Christianity era, we tend to always just see myself as the center of everything. But God has designed us to live in community because there are many lessons we cannot learn apart from community. For example, we cannot learn how to love our neighbor without a community. We cannot learn how to uh, develop patience and long suffering unless mm -hmm. you meet people that really irritates you. But these are all God's uh, training processes. And then as we do that, we, we begin to grow uh, far deeper than just being caught up and say, I have this problem. There's nothing like, uh, I agree, Bishop, there's, there's, weakness is not uh, a, a sin, all right? But uh, how you tackle it uh, will actually cause us to grow uh, in the Lord. So, so I think the community will help us to see things uh, uh, far greater than the community having a purpose uh, that is more than ourselves, but to be a blessing to others. Uh, will cause us to be able to fulfill the purpose of Christ uh, because we can't do it individually. So, so I think all these factors uh, come in. I hope, I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Okay, so we have about 10 more minutes before we wrap up, but I'll pass to uh, Georgie and to Victor for the remaining questions. Okay, thank you. And uh, this is a question for Bishop Brannis. In the process, we talk a lot about trusting God and so forth. And uh, we... All believers know that we and even quote the Bible on trusting God, but there is that disconnect in the personal life 
to, to struggle to really trust God in, in that sense. So we need to have uh, some help in that sense that maybe Bishop, you can just suggest some areas of our lives and how can we build our trust in God, so to speak. And related to this is a question from one from one in the audience. We, because we have been sharing a lot about uh, how to reach out to others, how can we be a light to others, how can we reach? But we also need to address many believers who are suffering themselves and, and how do they deal with their own uh, problem in practical ways. And also, especially we are in a very pervasive performance-driven culture, how can we spiritually discern and uh, bring us to live out the word of God in, in our actual day-to-day -day life. So over to you, Bishop Ennis. For the, thank you for the question. Um, I'll take it in two parts. One is what do you do when you really struggle to trust God? Uh, and that is something all of us face uh, at some point or another. And the way to respond uh, there in, in scripture and tested in experience is our knowledge of God must grow in a crisis in testing times. So I want to, to uh, uh, suggest to all of us that we mustn't isolate ourselves uh, and then say, oh, you know, it's all beyond us and have that uh, air of resignation. Um, our God is more than enough for all that we go through in life, but our knowledge of him, uh, knowing the God of scripture is a lifelong thing. And times of crisis actually draw us to dig deeper from the well. So don't neglect your devotional life. God may not speak to you just today, but as you linger in his presence, he will meet you. The second thing I can help with is uh, don't have to pretend before God. We can mourn our losses and bring our struggles to God. Uh, that's what he, he, that's the material he works with, you see, the honest uh, seeking heart. And he will not uh, be, uh, uh, that person will not be denied. That person will be responded to. Uh, to trust God to when we have these struggles. The point about community is important. So we do need one another. And it's true uh, what uh, Raphael said about how we can connect with each other much more now directly. So the phone, uh, the, the texting, etc., allows us also a different level of qualitatively helping each other during periods of doubt and despair. Uh, there is an irony in what uh, we, we both, Lawrence and I, have been sharing. When you struggle to trust God and you, you maybe experience his absence, you sort of discount yourself, you know, uh, in terms of uh, being used by God. But that's a, a, a lie, a deception. And I want to say to the person who's uh, having difficulty trusting God, your obedience is an expression of your faith. So we cry out in our struggle, but we don't stop obeying God. In other words, we need to... Um, and this requires God's help and strength uh, to live outside ourselves. So when you go out and help others, you will experience the presence of God, you know. So um, uh, it's a good question. I hope pastorally I can have outlined some of the ways in which to, to, to get out of a situation of not being able to trust God and beating yourself up for it. So I want to suggest the Psalms especially. Because the Psalms are prayers for in all kinds of situations for all seasons to address God. Now, the second part of the question, Georgie, is about believers who are suffering within the church, who may be themselves isolated or having uh, uh, difficulties for which they are needing help. So the, the community of care 
begins within the household of God and must flow out. That's the, the key point from what Lawrence was saying now. Uh, we must make sure the river of uh, life and love flows out. But that river must irrigate the community. So there is a need for pastors and leaders and one anotherness. So uh, elderly people, for example, for whom no one uh, is able to, to, to respond to their uh, daily needs, or maybe an occasion that needs to be celebrated, a wedding anniversary, etc., the church is there uh, caring for them, caring for people's real needs. And this is to include, of course, bread and butter financial needs. So cell groups pooling together to help a member through a critical period to pay the childcare fees, et cetera. These are important expressions. So the community of care is part of the witness, but it doesn't stop there. The community of care must go out, share the love and share the gospel. I hope that helps. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the final question for this segment here is uh, for Pastor Lawrence, I guess. Uh, Pastor Lawrence, you know, as many of us tuned in uh, to this uh, seminar this morning are from the marketplace. And in fact, uh, all of us organizers are from various marketplace ministries ourselves. Uh, we are facing this new norm, which is uh, a work from home model, right? Uh, in which there is uh, no water cooler talk, no pantry talk, there is no lunchtime gathering talk. Uh, all our meetings are video calls. Uh, many get online and then we have to put our mics on mute. We share slides on the screen. Uh, so there is far less personal interaction in this new work model. How do we continue to make an impact for the kingdom in the marketplace? Uh, in this phase three, which is apparently going to be somewhat indefinite. Pastor Lawrence? I think that there are always two sides of the same coin. On one hand, uh, I really miss, you know, even meeting my board face to face, uh, sitting in the same room and have some fun with each other. And just uh, once, once we're on Zoom, we are very, very uh, business-like and we just keep to the topic and uh, and so forth, and there's no side, you know, little uh, personal interaction, and so forth. So that's 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 just something that, uh, given the situation we have to live with. Yet, I discovered that the upside has been that uh, many churches now and many ministry now have learned to use the online platform to extend your influence or the message or or the reach of uh, what we're doing. The interesting thing I can report, and I don't think I have a solution to that, uh, except that uh, the report from my church, for example, uh, the cell group attendance is at all time high uh, because uh, now you have one less barrier that I have to kind of take care of uh, my children when I go to a cell meeting or this, uh, they, they, they can show up. And the interesting thing was that, uh, we have many pre-believers that come because we ourselves are always open to you know new people so that they can see the community life. One of the most powerful form of evangelism is community evangelism, where a pre-believer comes in and he sees the love and he sees the genuineness. Uh, it, it takes away a lot of a barrier or misconception. And we discovered that they, I mentioned just now that there are many who come because now, well, it's easy. Let me just show up. And they got sucked into it. In fact, uh, we have one case where someone came to know the Lord and we did deliverance over the Zoom. And, and, and demons were cast out and, and they found freedom. So uh, I, I thought, uh, I, we all want to go back to, you know, pre-COVID uh, situation. And I believe we will. But I think God is stretching us to use a certain dimension that we have never explored to its fullness. So I want to see the positiveness uh, of it and, uh, and take, make the most out of it. Uh, right, uh, uh, Bishop Rennes and, and uh, Pastor Edmund and myself, we meet every week on a WhatsApp chat, okay? And I tell you, we miss each other if we, uh, for some reason, could not show up. Okay? And we look at each other and we share things that we won't tell other people because we trust each other because of relationship. So I would say that uh, just make the best out of it and God is going to uh, uh, use that tool 
to help us advance this course. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Rennis and also Pastor Lawrence for, for joining us for this. And uh, we are very grateful for the insights that we have. I think we have been encouraged. I think uh, it's a good reminder. You know, we know life is tough. We have a lot of tribulations, but we know we can look unto our Lord Jesus. So we